Hello, my name is Angelina Jones, and I am a planner with Arlington County's Historic Preservation Program. I am delivering this presentation with my colleague from the county's urban forestry program, Adam LaPera. We are excited to tell you about the importance of heritage trees in Arlington's historic districts and what you can do to protect these important historic resources on your own property. Before we talk about the particulars of preserving and protecting trees, I wanted to provide some context for patterns of development in Arlington County, the way the county progressed from a rural agrarian landscape in the mid to late 19th century to a commuter streetcar suburb in the first half of the 20th century, and finally into its present form as a vibrant urban community, all of which has shaped the form of the tree canopy in the county. Historically, Arlington County, formerly called Alexandria County, was part of the District of Columbia, officially organized and placed under the control of Congress in 1801. In this map, you can see Alexandria County, which included the city of Alexandria to the west of the Potomac River, and Washington County, which included Georgetown and Washington City to the east of the Potomac. Congress returned present-day Arlington County to Virginia in 1846. The county was renamed Arlington in 1920. Before this time, um, it was called Alexandria County, and the renaming was initiated to avoid confusion with the independent city of Alexandria. Arlington County is a classic example of early suburban development in the United States, beginning with railroad and streetcar developments during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Railroad and streetcar or trolley suburbs generally built between the 1890s and 1920s were often products of speculative land development along transportation lines. Their buildings were of different types and styles, but uniform in scale and with similar setbacks from the street. Houses included those built by developers, contractors or builders, and individual property owners. Tree-lined roadways and lawns with specimen trees are an important feature of these historic suburban developments. Several Arlington neighborhoods are excellent examples of this very early suburban development type and are known today as Lion Village, Aurora Highlands, Penrose, Lion Park, Cherrydale, Ashton Heights, and Maywood. Maywood, developed starting in 1906, also has the distinction of being a local historic district. Design guidelines for Maywood's architecture also include protections for mature trees that are such an important part of the character of the area and of Arlington's tree canopy. It is important to note that the county was racially segregated during this period of rapid suburbanization. The Virginia legislature's 1912 amendments to the Virginia Constitution permitted municipalities to legally establish and enforce segregation districts, which led to local governments creating segregation district boundaries and setting parameters to dictate the racial makeup of neighborhoods within those boundaries. Segregation led to the inequitable distribution of resources, including of infrastructure and amenities, such as street trees, with neighborhoods inhabited by people of color receiving less or inferior resources to those allotted to white communities. This legacy of inequity may explain why the canopy coverage is below 30% in historically African-American neighborhoods of Green Valley, Penrose, Arlington View, and Halls Hill slash Highview Park. Compare this to some of the county's historically white neighborhoods, such as Ashton Heights with 40% coverage, or Maywood, which has 52% coverage. From the 1920s to the 1950s, much of Arlington's growth was spurred by the incredible expansion of the federal workforce in and around Washington, D.C. There was a critical need to create affordable, plentiful housing for both government workers and returning veterans. Arlington's population boomed as a result. For example, from 1940 to 1950, the county's population grew by 137%, from a little over 50,000 residents to more than 130,000. With the creation of the Federal Housing Administration, or FHA, in 1934, various programs before, during, and after the war helped finance multifamily housing projects, including military housing, garden apartment complexes, 
and single family homes for returning veterans and their families. Garden apartments reflect planning principles developed as part of the Garden City movement that advocated well-planned, affordable communities designed to provide the amenities of the city in a rural setting. Typical design features include large open green spaces, separation of vehicular and pedestrian traffic, airy well-ventilated apartments, and lawns planted with flowering shrubs and specimen trees. Arlington's proximity to the nation's capital and the planners and designers of the FHA allowed the county to become a testing ground for these new ideas on planning and architecture. The first FHA financed apartment complex in the country, Colonial Village here in Arlington, included explicit racially based restrictive covenants in its subdivision application and was used as a model for later single race rental communities in Arlington. Deeds of subdivision, as well as deeds for individual parcels in Virginia during this time, commonly incorporated restrictive covenants to prevent racial integration in segregated white neighborhoods. Restrictive covenants and other tools for segregation meant that garden apartment complexes in Arlington most commonly created residential opportunities for white Americans while excluding people of color. These discriminatory practices continued until the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968, which outlawed these restrictive covenants nationally. In 2003, with an update in 2011, the county completed a National Register of Historic Places nomination for Arlington's Garden Apartments. In total, 174 complexes and individual resources were identified in that study. Three of these complexes are Arlington County Local Historic Districts, Colonial Village, discussed on the previous slide, Buckingham, and present-day Cambridge Courts. The county also holds exterior preservation easements on Courthouse Manor, Wakefield Manor, and Whitefield Commons. Given the large number of garden apartments in the county, it should be no surprise that the trees planted on the grounds of these complexes contribute greatly to the county's overall urban canopy. Similar to the Maywood neighborhood discussed earlier, the zoning overlay for the county's local historic districts includes protections for trees as well as buildings. This makes local historic district designation a powerful tool to protect the mature heritage trees found at Colonial Village, Buckingham, and Cambridge Courts. Now I will turn the presentation over to Adam, who will be speaking more specifically to things that you can do to protect heritage trees on your own property. My name is Adam LaPera, and I am a Morster with Arlington County. And today we are going to be talking about trees and the urban environment. So some of the topics that we're going to cover today are overview of our urban forest, uh, the valley trees, uh, tree canopies in specific local historic districts, uh, forest health and threats. Uh, Going to briefly go over some of our urban forestry programs from ordinances all the way down to planting and hazard response. And finally, uh, working with aging trees on your property, including uh, trees with that have been experienced oak decline, and then also just some of our partnerships and programs that you're involved with. Depending on who you ask, trees are going to have uh, an essential value. Um, and according to different folks, uh, whether they are tree lovers or forestry professionals, uh, the value of those trees are going to have a different order or, or magnitude. But I think we can all get on the list on the screen um, of, of tree values. So whether it is mental and physical health benefits from trees, uh, whether you look at them more from a wildlife perspective and, and value, um, even to stormwater reduction and stormwater credits for, for properties and parcels. Um, I know myself, it's been a little hot. My AC has been on the fritz. So uh, some of the trees in my backyard have been uh, helping cool my house. I wait for the AC repair guy to come and, and, uh, and fix our, our fan. Um, a lot of folks are, are tied trees to having an increased property value. Uh, of course, uh, it can go the other way as well. Uh, if you have a stand of uh, invasives or, or dead trees, maybe that could decrease a property value. Um, also, trees are, are, are beautiful to some, uh, not to all, but I think most of us listening to this uh, think that they have that value. 
Um, and then, of course, kind of going back to wildlife, they not only can be uh, food for critters and then forest uh, animals, but also for ourselves. So back in 2017, we did a tree canopy study, um, and this was uh, in conjunction with some previous studies that we have done. And our, our main reason to do this was to see where our tree uh, data was at the time, and then also to compare it to uh, previous studies. So the study purpose was to provide uh, that baseline data to measure the logical, social, and economic benefits that uh, the tree canopy provides us here in Arlington County. Uh, over the next couple slides, you'll see uh, just a snippets of, of the data to compare, um, and I specifically just pulled out um, a canopy in, in local historic districts, but I will give you kind of a big picture of all of Arlington as well. So I'm kind of a map guy. Uh, I like to look at maps and stare at them and stare at them some more and kind of compare all the little nitty gritty things in them. So. Uh, over these next couple of slides, I, I do urge you to do the same. Just give it a pause and, and stare at them for a while if it uh, piques your fancy. But this slide right here is the tree canopy land cover uh, by classification in Arlington County. Um, so, for example, obviously the green is, is the trees. Um, the darker the green, the more dense it is. Um, some of the layer greens that you see are some grasses or low vegetation, could be low shrubs, could be low lying trees, small cow trees. Um, the gray is your infrastructure, some of your impervious surfaces. So you see what stands out is, you know, National Airport, Pentagon, uh, some of the RB corridor. Uh, and of course, you do see a little bit of bare soil and some open water. But that table on the right hand side gives you uh, the tree canopy in acres and also as a percentage. If you're looking uh, at tree canopy in Arlington, including the airport, it's 38%. Uh, if you're excluding the airport and also the, some DOD land that we have, it's around 41%. Um, and we did that just to compare uh, to the previous studies in 08 and, and 11 uh, since we collected data. Uh, for DOD and airport and excluding the DOD and airport. So next we're going to look at tree canopy by civic association. And uh, if you're able to, you might have to zoom in a little bit if you want to see the different uh, little civic associations in the county. Um, but on the next few slides, I actually blew it up uh, a little bit more. So don't panic everything now. Uh, I'm looking on my screen. My eyes aren't that bad and, and it's uh, pretty hard to see zoomed out. Uh, but this just shows you uh, percent of canopy by civic association. Uh, so the darker the green, the higher the percent. Um, so as you can see, way up north, uh, kind of in Arlington, Arlingwood through Donaldson, uh, run through a little bit of, uh, you know, Mont and Maywood, you see some pretty dark green. And uh, that's due to uh, a lot of tree preservation up there. Um, not as much development as other parts of the county. Um, but also you have the parkway and a lot of NPS land. So a lot of it is uh, protected and hopefully it will stay that way for, for a long time. Uh, as you can see uh, down uh, kind of toward the Falls Church border, you can kind of start to see a little corridor forming. And, and of course, uh, if you're familiar with that, that area, there is quite a lot of development in that Williamsburg uh, kind of Falls Church um, that area there. Shown here are different tree canopy percentage in local historic districts. So what I did is I went from that uh, map on slide 13, the previous slide, um, and just zoomed in on, on the specifics uh, that Angelina asked me to uh, in on. So you can see here, uh, uh, upper corner is, is May with 2%, Clone Village around 34%, um, Buckingham around 24, and then Lion Park, which, which uh, encompasses Cambridge Courts is on 34%. So here you can caught, kind of pause, uh, taking a look at these these maps, look at the map beforehand and kind of see where uh, where the canopy percentages are higher, where they're lower. Um, and then of course, as we'll talk about in a little bit, it helps uh, staff internally decide where to plant trees and where to focus on some efforts. Here we have tree canopy change by civic association. Uh, so as you see in the upper left-hand corner, this is canopy change from 2016 data. Uh, 
to 2011 data. So it's about a five and a half year change or so. Um, in, the, in the legend, uh, red is where you have a greater than 5% decrease in canopy. So canopy went down by more than 5%. Um, the yellow, yellow orange is zero five percent decrease, and then your greens into the positives. Uh, so you can see, like I said a little bit, a little bit ago, you can see from Rock Spring, Williamsburg, um, kind of down into into Falls Church, Dominion Harriet, you can see a large decrease, uh, and then of course uh, some in the RB corridor as well. Um, out of this is is due to development. We've seen a huge development spike in Rock, Williamsburg, Yorktown. Uh, in those general areas that you see, that, uh, a lot of this is due to developers, present, you know, clear cutting the lots, working out most of the tree, and of course they're required to plant more. But uh, obviously, it's harder to make up that canopy, um, especially if it's if it's a tree uh, that has a significant canopy over the lot that is now lost. Um, so you can see, pause on here, take a look around, zoom in and out if you can, um, and really take a look at at where we're having decreases in, in the uh, in the county, but also take a look at increases. And uh, some of the areas that are increased might surprise you a little bit. Now, of course, we look at this and, and we say, okay, where are areas that we need focus efforts on tree planting, whether it's in the right of ways, uh, in utility strips or in parks. Uh, so this, area, this map and, and these kind of percent changes um, by association or just by in, in, in general, uh, really kind of tells us the tale of where to focus, maybe where we don't need to focus as much, um, and, and so on. So as I was saying, the uh, take and planning implications from this recent study that we did, uh, it, it helps us in areas that we want to prioritize planting in areas that are uh, have had a lot of canopy loss or just have a lot of canopy to begin with. Um, it also helps us target outreach efforts with our, our tree canopy fund. So whether that's through our tree distribution program or uh, through our partner with Eco Action Arlington, um, it helps us identify those areas. Um, it also uh, helps us with our, our current revision of the uh, forest and natural resources master plan. Um, and it also informs planning activities countywide, so for other departments and other folks. And as you can kind of see in that photo, that is one park area managers, Lindell Core. And uh, that is actually an area in one of our parks that uh, himself and uh, some volunteers have uh, replanted. So uh, it's just something that you know we identified a large area that needed some some added canopy desperately and um, uh, sourced the plants ourselves and planted them volunteers. And actually, it's I think on year number two um, and doing quite well out there. Uh, it's also a uh, uh, blue moth past the rose garden uh, for anybody interested. So what are some threats to our urban forest or forests in general? Um, the big ones that I think everybody usually guesses are, are storm development, um, but also invasive plants. Uh, deer pressure, we don't have a whole lot of that in this county, but uh, as you go outward, um, away from our, our county toward the 66 corridor, that is one of the biggest things that is uh, threatening urban forests or less urban forests. Um, of course, pests and diseases, and, and of course we do monitor that uh, to some degree here in Arlington. Climate change, as we in the presentation a little bit further, um, you'll hear our thoughts on, on oak decline and, and potentially climate change being one of the factors. Uh, development, like I said, that's, uh, that sure was actually taken uh, at the corner of George Mason and Washington Boulevard. It's now the um, those uh, eight or nine new houses that went in there that used to be wooded lot. And of course, poor practices. So there you see in, in the picture somebody uh, topped or lolly popped or whatever you want to call it, a parking lot tree. So uh, that can also get into the, the, the debate of right tree, right place, but that is still a poor practice. Um, but definitely, you know, some of the biggies in our county, development, storms, uh, invasives, and potentially now some climate change. So some of our urban forestry programs uh, that our office uh, has deals with laws, ordinances, and planning, uh, standards and best practices, including enforcement, uh, tree planting, uh, and of course, maintenance as well of those trees. 
uh, extreme weather response, hazard response, um, anywhere from uh, uh, summer windstorms and thunderstorms, all the way to hurricanes, also snow, uh, invasive plant control, and, and we do have an invasive unit with our natural resources unit that we partner with. Uh, tree distribution and tree canopy fund. So like I said, uh, we have distribution program um, internally, and then we also partner with Arlington to use funds from the tree canopy fund to uh, plant uh, trees on private property. And I'll, and I'll get into some more of this later as well. Uh, we do have some special tree designations. We have uh, notable trees, uh, champion trees, spend trees. And then of course we do uh, some education and outreach when we have the time, uh, including this presentation. I'm going just to touch on our tree laws and ordinances briefly because this in itself could be a two hour long presentation. Um, but we do uh, enforce and also rely and structure these different laws and ordinances, including uh, Chesapeake Bay Ordinance, RBA restrictions. We do work with DES Stormwater on, on enforcing and uh, consulting on RBA uh, removals. Uh, we have fairly strict tree replacement guidelines and planting guidelines. Uh, we also do have some tree damage fines. Um, and then, of course, like I said, Integrated Forest and Natural Resources Master Plan uh, from 2004 is currently being revised, and I included a link. Uh, you can go to that link and see uh, our list update uh, status and, and kind of where we're sitting with the plans. It did get off to a slower start, but uh, we're kind of ramping up to it uh, currently. So be up for revised uh, master plan soon. Our in-house and contract crews adhere to standards and practices, as many uh, tree professionals should and, and most do. Um, but we have strict tree planting standards. We have soil volume and quality standards. Um, we try to canopy in public spaces, not just our parks, but in, in roadways as well, utility strips, median strips. Uh, and then we also enforce tree protection and uh, tree measures on all county projects, whether it's a water, mine re water main replacement all the way to a bus stop project, to a park project, or um, you know, new aquatic center, for example. So no matter the size of the scope, uh, protection is, is given on these projects and by our office. Uh, so as you can see in some of these photos here, pretty good photos, they show soil volume calculations for a certain size and potentially uh, you know, what size volume depth uh, pit structure size uh, is needed per species. Our website also has a lot more depth information about soil volumes and also right tree rice. And then, of course, uh, down below you can see plant the right tree in the right place, and you see a distribution utility line, looks like a face circuit, uh, and it shows you should plant within different zones. So in that first zone, uh, you know, from the utility pole out 20 to 25 feet or so, a small tree such as redwood dogwood, and then as you get further out, you can start planting them to large trees. Uh, our website also has a master list of uh, trees that are great under utility lines, uh, trees that are considered small species, medium large, um, and, and really it's a great wealth of information. Um, I'll go over this again at the end of the, end of the PowerPoint uh, as well, but um, everything is also on our website and I will give you that link. So our uh, planning and maintenance program within Parks and Natural Resources um, is a pretty vast program. We, we plant 800 tree, trees yearly. Uh, that depends on our current contract price, of course. Um, also water uh, all of our, our newly planted trees for up to two years. Um, if more is needed, then we will do it in-house uh, after the contract is ended. Uh, we do prune uh, structurally and preventatively our, our young trees. Uh, we also have a great group of volunteers that helps us with this. Um, with our natural resources unit, we do do some integrated pest management. Um, so whether that's using canvas stat for vegetation regulators or doing soil injections for our uh, emerald ash borer trees um, and even our uh, elm at Oakland Park. And then of course we do uh, do some disease and pest monitoring. 
Uh, last year we did band for spotted lanternfly, and unfortunately we have not found it here yet. Um, of course, we are all going to uh, seminars and talks regularly, uh, not only for EAB, but also for spotted lanternfly and, and some of the other pests that are known in our area. This is probably my, my favorite part of the presentation. It's where I get to tell you to go get some trees. Um, both of these programs are uh, used pretty heavily by Arlingtonians, but I do feel like there is room for even more people to take advantage of it. Um, the first is our Tree Canopy uh, grant program where we partner with EcoAction Arlington. And uh, you, you can apply as a homeowner or as a condo owner. Uh, or as an association president uh, to have trees planted on your private property. Whatever that private property looks at, um, that's something that you can fill out a form for. Uh, take some pictures of desired locations. Maybe you have a certain tree in mind that you would just absolutely love to have in your yard or in your association's yard and property. And then you, uh, you send that into EcoAction and um, they will likely approve it. Uh, every year they do meet twice, once in the wintertime, once in the summertime, basically for the planting seasons. And they go through the list of applications and approve or deny or ask for more information and clarity on certain applications. I can say as being a part of all these review sessions with EcoAction, almost every tree gets accepted. Um, there are directions on crystal, uh, so please apply. There is, I wanna say no shortage of fund at, funds at the moment for uh, getting a tree planted in your private property. Of course, also done watering, so you don't even have to uh, be responsible for watering that tree. So go check out their website link here. You'll get a lot of great information on um, potentially what you do and what you can have in your yard. And of course, uh, they are a great ally uh, with us. Now, we also have a tree distribution program that's run through our landscape department uh, in, in Park Natural Resources. Uh, we typically give out around 500-ish trees a year. Um, uh, you can see folks here are picking it up at, at our uh, plant nursery, which is, is kind of behind uh, the Barcroft ball fields. Um, so again, check out that website uh, linked here as well and uh, see if that's something that you're interested in. And like I said, please take advantage of uh, some free trees. Um, when I say free, I mean they are actually free. So part of and parks and natural resources is also responding to, to hazards. Um, these typically uh, occur during uh, storm events. So whether it's a windstorm or a rainstorm or a snowstorm, um, our crews with the assistance of other park area crews will clear streets and sidewalks of down, down tree debris and limbs. Uh, we will do tree and hazard limb removals uh, due to storm damages. Uh, we, of course, coordinate with utility companies when those trees or limbs uh, may interfere with power lines or are too close to power lines. Um, this cleanup often lasts months. Uh, for the duration, show, uh, I know that lasted about six to seven months. I was with the utility sector. Uh, I can only imagine Arlington was also at the same time. Um, but if you do see a hazard or downed uh, public tree and they're not involved with any utility lines, whether it's power or even cable, uh, give our front desk a call at uh, extension 6525. And of course, if you do see limbs involved with any type of line, even if you know for sure that is a cable line, please call Dominion uh, Energy. Um, only many contractors are allowed to work within proximity of power line. That proximity feet uh, away from a single phase, double phase, or three phase primary, so the very top wire, and three feet an insulated secondary or an insulated house. Uh, so that's going from transformer to meter base. Um, also, with the potential of cable line back from power lines, we are also not allowed to prune around your uh, Comcast or your Fios lines. That will also have to be called into Dominion Energy uh, at their main line that's listed uh, below. So actually, I take that back. This may be my favorite slide out of all of them. And it's because of this photo. Now, this photo was taken by a colleague of mine uh, back when I used to work for Dominion Power. And uh, this is somewhere in Texas after a storm event. And I always like to get from the audience 
how many mistakes is I making? And the obvious one is the safety line is not there, or if he does hit his safety line, then he may need to go back and, and hit the textbook again. Um, he's also not wearing any PPE. Um, he is dangling fairly close to uh, a power line. It is insulated, but still that could give you a nice little zap. Um, and then also, that's just not how you prune a tree. Um, you know, it looks like this could have been probably worked from a bucket, uh, since that pole kind of in, in the background there, bottom of your screen. Uh, typically, those aren't very tall poles from uh, for feeding secondary wire like you see there. Anyway, just fun photo, take it, steal it, copy it, uh, do whatever. It's just kind of uh, something fun. But this goes into trees and power lines. Um, so kind of tree right place. A couple slides ago, uh, here you see that uh, that picture in the upper left corner of you know, green zone, yellow, and red zone, and it gives you heights and widths of trees to plant. And like I said earlier, you can go to our website and check our master tree list. And okay, so green zone is is tree uh, space, you know, maybe no longer than uh, 15 feet wide, no more than 20 feet tall, and it gives you an idea of what trees you're looking at for for zones. Uh, also, if you are in an area that has underground power, you'll often see these pad-mounted transformers. Uh, this is your bottom left, uh, upper, and it gives you distances to place uh, trees and shrubbery around those. Usually, there's also a diagram on the actual pad-mounted transformer itself, uh, labeling that as, as such. Um, so, right tree place is really important. So, in the in the bottom kind of right photos, you can see. Uh, you know, maybe a nice little oak tree or something planted right underneath the three-phase power line. And of course, they're to keep safe, reliable power. The power company came in and gave it a nice uh, topping. Uh, now, if you planted that same tree, say, 40 feet to the side of the power line, you see that uh, it's kept its shape, likely very minimal or no power line clearance trimming is needed. Uh, so it just kind of reiterates that safe uh, or right place is, is really something to abide by. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, you see the beginning of the V pruning or uh, some or L pruning as a photo uh, book. All these are uh, ANSI standard uh, pruning techniques that, of course, aren't the most aesthetically pleasing. The question we often receive is, what can I do with the older trees on my property? One of the first things we tell people is minimize the damage to the root and the trunk zones. So in the tree's critical root zone, what lies beneath is one good way to preserve uh, your trees and make them as long as possible. So a critical root zone is the zone of roots around a tree uh, relative to their tree size. So if you have a 30-inch diameter tree, the critical root zone will uh, be around 30 feet surrounding the tree. Now, oftentimes tree roots don't, don't of course grow in a perfect little circle. So if you have structures or driveway and stuff that in the way, obviously your critical root zone uh, will be a different uh, shape. But the critical root zone or the drip line of a tree is a good indicator of where those roots fall. So if you respect the roots, respect your you know tree's trunk and trunk flare, you can definitely minimize damage and, and prolong the life of your tree. Getting regular inspections from certified arborists is always a great thing. So just like you have to get your AC checked on, like I do today, um, you can also have your trees checked on. Um, the website uh, link on, on this page is a great resource. Uh, you just enter in your zone and up will pop uh, quite a few results on arborists in your area. Of course, if you are in a local district and you do get the pleasure of having uh, kind of an on-call arborist in ourselves, that can consult on trees uh, located on your property. You can also improve soil conditions by doing soil tests or top dressing it with mulch. Uh, watering definitely helps as well. So trickle, trickle water a few times a week uh, in the critical root zone uh, for your mature trees and of course for your younger trees as well. Um, also turf grass and trees don't work great together. Reduce lawn air when you can. Um, a lot of us, you know, we runs for our, our kids and kids and, and whatnot and dogs and to round on and, and do their business on. But uh, if you can just eliminate some of the lawn around your trunk, uh, potentially within that critical root zone or part of all of it, um, then your trees is going to have a lot more resources available to it. And then, of course, prune and remove trees if they are, uh, you know, too 
risky. So if, if you have multiple hangers in a tree or if a, a sizable amount of your tree's crown is uh, filled with dead wood, it might be time to remove the dead wood or consider removing the tree. One of the kind of hot ticket items around this area nowadays is what exactly causes the dieback and death in old trees? And uh, I think it's due to a lot of different factors, but uh, age definitely plays a part. Uh, diseases, whether it's uh, bacterial or fungal, um, root damage from construction or landscaping. Um, so something as small as putting shrubs around your tree, if you're disrupting that uh, tree's roots, that could lead to uh, die back in death. And of course, if you're doing a fold model or a tear down, that obviously can uh, can have a big impact to tree roots uh, if they're within proximity of that construction footprint. Um, as such as emerald ash borer, gypsy moss, spotter, lanternfly can also wreak havoc on, on trees. Uh, fortunately, we haven't really seen the latter yet, but uh, EAB has taken a toll on many of the ash trees in this county uh, and, of course, in the in the general area as well. Uh, I know uh, last year we removed uh, a number of ash trees that uh, even I was a little surprised about the quantity of. Uh, severe drought and climate change can also cause some dieback, and, and we'll get into that in a minute with some oak decline. Uh, storms. Um, especially uh, after, but we're seeing right now, especially after a wet spell, uh, where you get these super saturated soils, a little bit of wind later on, and next thing you know, you have a tree toppling over. Um, and then, of course, competition from new plants. Um, so, like I said, if, if you uh, plant around the tree, if you plant uh, next to the tree, if you plant a new tree on a tree, uh, that's just more competition for your old tree. So if you eliminate some of the competition for resources, that, that older tree is going to have a better chance of uh, surviving and thriving in environment. Now, one thing I, I do like to let people know of is uh, just because a tree is dead doesn't mean it's not of value to our environment. So oftentimes you'll see our crews in our park system uh, leave low snags or maybe some wood waste, some logs uh, in the wood environment. Now, these snags are left to a height so that if they were to fall, they typically wouldn't hit a uh, trail or, or any park. There's um, definitely no playground. Uh, but they are, you know, home to woodpeckers, home to different little critters. Uh, and, it, you know, it's just a way to kind of uh, leave something for them in our woods. Um, especially if it, does, it has a very low risk value. And like I said, if it doesn't have a chance to fall over and um, cause damage to a user or a, or a, an asset, then we will leave snags and, and wood piles. Oak decline is something that popped up uh, over the last uh, about two years or so and has made local news attention. Um, oaks, uh, mainly in the white oak groups, such as nut oak, white oak, uh, have died in significant numbers uh, in recent years. Uh, we've also this year begun to see some red oak back as well. Uh, just kind of some history that you may already know. The past decade, this area has seen some significant changes in wet and dry seasons. Um, we've had extended uh, long hot spells and extreme storms that have increased. Uh, this, along with historical and current changes from our solar network, from the increment impervious area county to undergrounding of certain streams, uh, we believe all caused a long-term stress in trees that could even take decades to show impacts. And so some of those impacts uh, could have been from a long time ago and that we're now just seeing uh, within the last year or two. Like I said before, trees can also be damaged by cutting their roots and damaging bark and branches. Production damage either on your property or on property nearby can also cause significant diebacks in trees and may also be a cause of this oak decline. So what as owner can you do? Uh, first, you, and probably the easiest, is you can avoid damage to trees. So anything, like I've said prior, from landscape work to rebuilding a home can damage the tree roots. Um, you can consult an ISA certified consulting arborists and they can go out and give you a lay of the land. Uh, in terms of uh, assessing it, also giving damage prevention to best uh, protect those trees of yours. Uh, watering during dry spells, you know, trickle water hose, 
uh, several times a week uh, within the critical root zone can definitely help your mature tree or really any tree. Um, revitalizing the soil with wood chips. Uh, so if you spread wood chips around three inches deep, three inches away from the trunk and as far out into that critical root zone as you're coming with, just gives it the tree a little bit more organic matter to deal with, a little bit, uh, a little bit of a, of a to its immune system if you want, if you want to go that route. Um, other thing that you consider is assess your tree with an arbor not associated with the tree company. So basically, it's not going to try to sell, sell you sales of a tree, whether it be fertilization, pruning, removal. Um, you can also consult with the uh, Virginia Department of Forestry Forester if one is available for area. You can also consult with the Virginia Cooperative Extension of your trees, and they are, of course, located in our Farlington Community Center. Uh, like I said on, a, on the previous slide, you can even consider leaving declining trees. If the decline is later in the year, it's just maybe a natural reaction and the trees could recover in the new year or new leaf out. So if you notice a tree isn't doing so great in the fall, uh, winter time, maybe just uh, sit on it for a few months, wait to see what it looks like at leaf out and then make a determination then. A lot of times these trees that don't look so great in the fall end up rebounding just fine the next year, or they might rebound maybe not to was uh, you know fully leaf out in years past, but still to the point where the tree has some life left in it. Uh, give your tree some space. Like I said, uh, trees and lawns don't always work well during the jive. Uh, consider removing some lawn around your tree. Just, again, give that tree extra resources um, so it doesn't have to compete as much. Avoid using fertilizer or chemical applications. Uh, many of these fertilizers and chemicals can harm your soil, change levels, um, and then, of course, can also harm your tree. Recommend only using chemicals and fertilizers when you know there's a problem. Um, maybe you've already done a soil test uh, or had a professional assessment done. Currently, what we're doing and, and other local governments and extension offices are doing, we're getting as much out to residents, volunteer groups as we can, as we as we learn of the information. This is still a little bit new to all of us. Um, so as we gather information, we are, we are reviewing what we are uh, pushing out there, either verbally or, or electronically. We are monitoring emergent pests that needs for trees. Like I said, we have been doing some spotter lanternfly banding. Luckily, we, they have not made it to, to uh, Arlington County yet. We also coordinate with state and local experts on new research. Um, so we work pretty closely with the Virginia Department of Forestry and, and their uh, team on all these things. We have also shared samples of dead and dead trees with universities. Uh, last year, I sent two samples to Virginia Tech for analysis and one to University of Maryland, uh, and just to get some some information on the death that we saw and, and potentially what was affecting um, that particular tree. And of course, you assess uh, the risk and failure and impact of dead and dying trees on our public property, so on county-owned land. Um, myself and my colleagues that are certified arborists do this routinely. Uh, it's a pretty major component uh, of, our, of our job. Uh, so uh, affected trees that have shown symptoms from fungal pathogens, insect damages, and bacterial diseases, uh, some of these sources are what we like to call secondary factors or something that kind of comes along with the tree after it's already weakened from another actor. Um, our general recommendation is do not for diseases or about knowing the cause of the decline, uh, you know, without consulting somebody first. Um, treating for these diseases that are not present in your tree, if you just think they're present, um, if you treat them, it will not only uh, not help the tree's likelihood of survival, but it's also just a waste of money, uh, time, and it can also have negative impacts on just the general local ecosystem um, of the area. Uh, a, a disclaimer or something to kind of refute, uh, there have been some reports of oak wilt or sudden oak death uh, in Virginia, but to date, there have not been any confirmed by the last in Virginia yet. Um, that's not to say that it might be happening, but the labs that have been testing for oak wilt sudden oak death uh, have not found any evidence here in Virginia. Um, and that was also confirmed by the Virginia Department of Forestry staff. Uh, so more information on, on some of the in-depth analysis of broad-scale oak decline can be found on the Virginia Department of Forestry website, or VDOF. Um, if you Google that and search uh, oak decline, they're going to have a lot of uh, great resources, uh, some of which are written by Lori Chamberlain. Um, so please take a, take a look at those. And then our, our website, uh, which is at the bottom of this slide, has uh, 
much more in-depth information for any uh, oak decline concerns and some how-tos. And then we also link to various agencies and programs, um, you know, from VDOF to other municipalities, what they're doing with oak decline, um, all the way to, you know, our extension agents as well. So check out check out our link down at the bottom, environment.arlington.us slash oak decline, and you'll see a, a plethora of information that will hopefully answer more questions than, than what I went over today. So what more can you do? You can maintain and protect your mature trees. Of course, we discussed you can plant a diversity of new native trees where appropriate. Uh, they can come from Eco Action Arlington, our tree distribution program, or you know, you know, if you just wanted to buy one at a local garden center, that's fine too. Um, removing non-invasive vines, and I emphasize non-native invasive vines, uh, is something that's great. Um, vines are one of the uh, easiest ways to choke out and kill a tree. Uh, limit the lawn area, like I said. I can't stress this enough. Um, I know we love our pets on our lawns, but uh, if, if you can get turf away from uh, the tree within its root zone, um, that is one of the best things you can do. Back on unnecessary fertilization, unless it's prescribed by a certified arborist, um, trees don't really need food. They make their own. Uh, reduce compaction around your trees. So let those roots breathe, let them uh, not stomped on uh, for better better terms. So that means if you park vehicles or trailers on top of your root zone, that is uh, a way to bend. If you, uh, of course, lay uh, impervious sur uh, surfaces over them, that, uh, that is a, a great way to compact um, your tree's roots. So uh, the more you can uh, let them, let those roots breathe uh, naturally, the better. And of course, advocate for trees for your neighbors. So your neighbors, may not be as in tune uh, trees as you all are. Um, so spread the word, uh, spread the presentation, spread some resources that are uh, routinely distributed by our, our tree stewards and, and group that sort. Um, just kind of get the word out there and get people educated on, on, uh, on trees and how best to take care of them. So as I've been talking about some of our partnerships and programs in the county, uh, are listed on this, on this page. Um, we consult with and work with uh, uh, VDOF uh, quite regularly at the state level. Um, our Urban Forest Commission is one of our biggest allies uh, here in the county, and, and they, they help us advise on, on issues and, and present them to the board. Um, Eco Action Arlington uh, is, is a great resource for our uh, tree distribution on private land. Uh, of course, our tree stewards and master naturalists uh, help us with volunteer events out in the field from uh, pruning trees to uh, measuring notable trees and champion trees and just everything tree related. Um, those groups are, are fantastic ally and um, are always looking for more members. So uh, if, 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 any, if any of that sounds interesting to you, check out their websites and um, potentially join their group and, and, and join the effort of uh, protecting our trees um in the county now we also have a notable and specimen tree program uh, and both of these programs can, uh, can be applied by property owners uh, the notable tree program is is just a kind of a recognition award of trees that are notable in size or notable for our neighborhood um, our urban forestry commission votes on what is and what is not a notable tree um, and lately, we've actually been getting a lot of vacations in for notable trees, and a lot of a lot of them have been getting approved. Um, you can also check out our website. You can see a full list of uh, the notable trees in the county, including which which are uh, approved per year, uh, with some pretty nice photos and some details on that. Um, like I said, it has to be submitted by the uh, property owner, or it can be submitted by a neighbor with property owner consent. Um, again, all, all the details are on our website if you search notable tree. Uh, same goes for specimen tree. Specimen tree is a little bit more uh, recognition. If, if notable tree is kind of a, a gold star on your, on your uh, spelling, spelling bee port, uh, then a specimen tree is the, at the far end of that spectrum. Uh, it actually is uh, reviewed by staff, um, by myself and my colleague. It is compared against a uh, uh, a tree list within the state, and if it falls within a certain percentage of a specimen tree or a tree of similar size, then it is awarded specimen status. Now, 
where this differs from a notable tree is that specimen trees are actually protected um, by law, uh, meaning that if you were to cut down or remove a specimen tree without permission, it could carry a fine. Now, specimen trees are also recorded on the deed of the property. So uh, once the board has approved our specimen trees for that year, uh, it then gets turned over to land records and that tree is actually a part of the deed of your house, which uh, leads me to this. It can only be applied by the property owner since since it is tied to their, their property deed. Uh, if you search, again, search for specimen tree on our website, you'll see the form, you'll see kind of all the uh, legal ramifications and, uh, you know, kind of all the particulars on specimen tree. We, that said, we don't have very many specimen trees in the county. Uh, we have about two dozen or so, and uh, most of them, fortunately, are on private property. So that concludes the presentation by Angelina and myself. Our contact information is listed on the page, as well as our respective uh, county and unit uh, pages. Um, Herb Forestry also has a general inbox that you're more than welcome to email. Um, that goes to all the urban foresters uh, and staff. Um, so if you don't want to just reach me, uh, you can reach uh, my colleagues by emailing urbanforestry at arlingtonva.us. And I do have to apologize. The picture that you see there is uh, at one of the outreach events back when I was with Dominion Power, and it was planting a tree in uh, your neighbor, Alexandria's uh, uh, territory. So it was at uh, Mount Vernon Community School. So I apologize. I probably should have used a picture from one of our Arlington Arbor Days, but um, this was one of the clearest ones that I had of, of uh, myself and some little kiddos planting a little redbud tree. So if you're ever in Delray, uh, check out the little redbud on Mount Vernon Avenue. It's thriving, doing great. And it was planted by about 50 first graders. So it just shows uh, that you don't have to be very old or very knowledgeable to plant a tree properly. Uh, that said, it's been a pleasure. Again, if you have any questions uh, or concerns or if you just want to talk trees with us, feel free to drop us a line. If you uh, if you want to talk uh, anything historic preservation with Angela, uh, drop her a line. And, and uh, Angelina and myself work pretty closely together. Uh, in regards to trees and properties. So uh, if you have a question for one of us, um, please uh, feel free to reach out. We're, we're happy to help. And, and a lot of times um, we actually like getting outside and interacting. Uh, it's been a pleasure and I hope everybody is, is staying safe and healthy in these COVID times. <laughs>